let me take you through a really nice proof for the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. I'll give you a simplified version of what it states, but you should know there are some conditions that have to be met. Um, the function we're working with, typically we call it f at t, and we use the dummy variable t instead of x because we use x um, for our variable of choice within the interval that we have. And it's important to know that this function f is continuous on the closed interval between a and b, and then our variable x is somewhere within a and b. Now, the fundamental theorem of calculus states that if all those conditions are met that I just said, then the integral from a, which is some constant, up to our variable x of f at t dt is equal to, first of all, a function of x, and we call it a of x, because typically we visualize the integral as the area under the curve between our lower and upper boundaries. And let me actually shade in for you what the area under the curve between a and x would look like. And notice that if I moved x right or left on this interval between a and b, that would change the area under the curve. So that's why we define the integral as being a function of x. As x changes, so will the area. Let me show you that in Desmos as well. So I've got this same function here in Desmos. Let me shade in the area between a and x. And notice that as I vary where x is, pay attention up here. I have that calculating the area for me between a and x under the curve. As I change where x is located, notice that the area under the curve is changing based on where I'm moving x to. So for every position of x, I get a different area. So the area function is dependent on where x is. Now here's the important part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. If we define the integral from a to x of f of t dt as a at x, then the derivative of a at x, so a prime of x, is equal to f of x. That's the important part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. It essentially is stating for us that integrals and derivatives are inverse operations of each other. So essentially, if we have an integral between a constant and the variable x, we can find the derivative of that just by taking the variable x and replacing our dummy variable t with that. And let me show you a proof of why we're allowed to do this. So let's start by rewriting a prime of x using our derivative from first principles rule. I know that derivative from first principles tells me that the derivative of any function, so a prime of x, will be equal to the limit as h goes to 0 of a at x plus h minus a at x all over h. And now let's interpret what is the area at x plus h and what's the area at x. And more importantly, what does the difference of those two areas represent? Let's start by looking at the area function at x plus h. Well, the area function, remember the integral, goes from a up to the variable. So if our variable is x plus h, that's the area from a to x plus h. So let's assume h is a positive value. On my diagram, I will place x plus h right here. And if I were to find the area from a all the way up to x plus h, it would be the area that I'll shade here for you. But now I need to subtract a at x. An area function at x, if I look back up to my integral, would just be the area from a to x. That's how we defined a at x. So I need to subtract the area from a to x. So if I subtract the area from a to x, let me just subtract that part of the area. And notice what I'm left with is the area between x and x plus h that's under the curve. So I could rewrite the numerator of my fraction as an integral. where my lower boundary is x, my upper boundary is x plus h of f at t dt. And this is all over h. Now here comes the important part. We're going to come up with an expression for the area of that green shaded region, the area between x and x plus h underneath the curve f at t. Now, if I were to draw a rectangle whose height was based on the left boundary of that interval, that rectangle would have an area that I'm shading here, and notice that is less than the true area between x and x plus h. 
If I use the right endpoint of that interval and made a rectangle at that height, notice this rectangle's area is more than the area under the curve. Based on the mean value theorem for integrals, if I were to choose the correct point between x and x plus h on the function and base the rectangle's height on that point, let's call that point, let's say that that point's x value is c. If I were to make the height of that rectangle based on f at c, the area of this rectangle would perfectly give the area under the curve. How does that work? Well, the part here that it overestimates would be exactly equal to the part here that it underestimates. Those two sections, right here and right here, have exactly equal areas. And how can we describe the area of that rectangle? Well, I know that the width of the rectangle is the distance between x and x plus h, so just h, and the height of this rectangle is equal to f at c. So I could rewrite this whole expression here as just f at c times h. And now with this expression, I notice that I can cancel out the h's and the limit will still be equal. And now we have to figure out what's going to happen to f at c as h goes to zero. Or more importantly, what's going to happen to the c value as h goes to zero. So as the value of h goes to zero, notice this x plus h is going to start going closer and closer and closer to x. And based on the squeeze theorem, since c is always between x and x plus h, I know that c is also going to be approaching x. So I could say the limit as h goes to zero of f at c is equal to f at x because c is going to get squeezed closer and closer to x by x plus h. Let me show you that in Desmos so you can better understand it. So let me readjust this to match what we have over there. So we were looking for an expression for the area between x and x plus h, which I've got shaded there with the purple region. And then based on the mean value theorem, we knew that there was some x value, which we called c, between x and x plus h, where if I made the height of the rectangle based on the value of the function at that point, the area of that rectangle would be exactly equal to the area under the curve. So that orange area is exactly equal to the purple area. And that's because, like I said before, this overestimated area would be exactly equal to that underestimated portion of the area. But now here comes the important part. As h approaches zero, so as h approaches zero, x plus h is gonna start getting closer and closer and closer to x. But as that happens, pay attention to what's happening to the c value. So as x plus h moves closer and closer to x, pay attention that c, which is always between x and x plus h, will also be approaching x. So notice as I slide x plus h closer and closer to x, c, which is trapped between x and x plus h, is also approaching x. So as h goes to zero, I know c is going to be approaching x. So I can state that a prime of x is equal to f at x. And that's the fundamental theorem of calculus. That's it. Stay tuned for the next video where I'll prove the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. And more importantly, I'll show you how we can use these fundamental theorems with lots of different questions in the calculus course. Let me zoom out so you can see the whole proof here for you. Jensen, man.